So friends, in this session, I'm going to tell you how to prepare for the super specialty exam for urology. Now, there are two components to it. One is why you should be choosing urology and preparing for urology. And second is how you should keep yourself motivated and make the right strategy so that you are able to kind of cover the huge syllabus that urology has in a very limited period of time and be able to revise it again and again, especially those questions which have been asked so many times. So uh, let's talk about the important aspects through which you will start to revise. So we know that Campbell is the main source by which you, it should be a lot of facts of the Campbell should be by your heart. So you don't have to make the entire book by heart. You have to just remember the important facts. The questions which are asked from it, they have to be by heart because we have to study smart. We don't have to just try and remember each and every fact given in Campbell. That's the ideal situation. But given the time, given that, you know, they have, we have limited number of hours, we have limited number of attempts that we can do. So we have to study smart. Now, basically, I'm going to make you run through the topics which are very, very important, especially from the revision perspective. So we'll start with the anatomy first. Now, when we look at the question papers, a lot of questions are asked from the anatomy side. So basically, it's all about the facts in anatomy. What are the number of minor calluses? What are the number of major calluses? What are the number of arteries? What are the number of veins? What are the branches of a particular artery? What are the tributaries of a particular vein? What are the tributaries of a draining area of the lymphatics? What are the supplies of the nerves? So these basic questions from anatomy, you have to no option but remember them. And to remember them, you have to basically make a list of these important uh, numbers and uh, relations and basically then you have to just keep revising through them so that these numbers remain well attached on your mind. Now, apart from that, the other question type of question which are asked with anatomy are basically the clinical importance. Like for example, the relation of particular structures to each other like the ureter and the uterine artery or maybe the ureter and the ileic vessels. Uh, so basically these kind of relations, they are one of the hot topics or favorite topics for examiners because it also reflects on the practical aspect somewhere. When, when you're going to be a urologist, when you're going to go into a course, they would expect that the uh, surgeon who has come should be aware of the basic facts so that it's easier to imbibe things, easier to know the practical aspects once your theory is clear. So from that perspective, many of the examiners, they would want to keep questions which are of clinical importance and clinical or applied anatomy is very, very important and some usually forms a big part of the anatomical questionnaire. Now, visual impression of the organ placement is also important because many times the question will be related to the relations of probably the kidney to the duodenum, the kidney to the spleen, the retroperitoneum, the number of fascias around the kidneys, the fascia around the penis, how they are communicating with the scrotal fascias, the abdominal fascias, all the other relations with regard to the inguinal canal and the vast difference to the spermatic cord, the vast difference to the uh, umbilical ligaments, the medial umbilical ligament, the lateral umbilical ligament, the median ligament, the urethras, all these things are important. So this visual impression of organ placement is something that is commonly asked from the anatomical perspective. Now the next uh, chapter or section usually that you will see in your books is on clinical decision. So clinical decision, the entire unit is based on how we are going to evaluate the patients, what are the differential diagnosis of a particular symptom, the symptomatology. And therefore, you will be needing to know everything about your analysis. So in this, you have to know about which particular kind of things we see in the urine, what are the reagents which are used to see those things, what are the false positives, what are the false negatives, and some values basically of the various laboratory parameters which help in clinical decision making. Then you have to know about the scoring system. So right from IPSS to SHIM score and a lot of other scores which are coming up now and then specifically with regards to tumors, cancers, prognostic indices, uh, scoring systems, they are basically all going to be important. IIEF 5, IIEF 15, these are some of the common ones which we have to know. Uh, then a lot of questions also come on hematuria because the evaluation of microscopic hematuria, macroscopic hematuria, this is an important topic. So right from knowing how many RBC should be there, 
how many RBC should be there over 24 hours, what is exercise induced hematuria, when do we call it as pathological hematuria, what is microscopic hematuria, what is macroscopic hematuria. All these uh, concepts around hematuria should be very, very clear and the algorithms on how to evaluate this hematuria from various types of various origins is also something which is very, very important when it comes to the preparation of urological super speciality. Then a lot of questions come also from contrast because one that there are facts around contrast where to use the low osmotic, where to use high osmotic, iodine based, non-iodine based, ionic, non-ionic and also how to deal with the contrast reactions. When do we safely can give contrast? What are the side effects of contrast? What is the creatinine level at which we can't give contrast? What is nephrogenic systemic fibrosis? What is the clearance required? Is MRI with contrast safe? Uh, these are some of the questions which are commonly asked around contrasts. And also you have to understand how these contrasts are used in various type of studies and we've discussed them in the imaging part in the MCQ section. We've talked about RGUs which are retrograde pilograms, micturating cystoeurythrograms, RGPs. We've talked about DMSS scans, nuclear scans, PET scans, CT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds contrast ultrasounds, cavernosograms, vasograms. So, they are all places where contrasts are being used and we should know how they look like, what are the findings when these contrasts are used and what are the advantages of using a contrast over non-contrast and one imaging modality over the other. So, basics of these imaging modalities, the principles, they are again very important questions. These are also asked and figures around these are also very important when it comes to basic. When does this phase start? When, when does the excretory phase start? When does the nephrogenic phase start? When does the arterial phase start? When does the, the washout phase start? So, all these kind of timings, you have, can make a list of them and you can always keep revising through them so that whenever they come as questions, you are prepared. Instrumentation is very, very important uh, in terms of questions. Not only urological instrumentation, but even laparoscopic instrumentation and the complications of laparoscopy. They are some important favorite topics of examiners. So, we should be well versed with all the instrumentation. I know it's difficult to remember them unless you've really done it with your own hands. But if you keep uh, looking at procedure videos whenever you're free, so you can go through procedure videos there, you know, you'll be introduced to the instruments. You can do some instrument uh, classes with urologists if you have uh, colleagues who are basically into urology if you are in a medical college still you can take some instrument based classes try and experience those instruments otherwise use the classes that we have taken uh, in the mcq section for the instruments so instrumentation the numbers the marking the types the advantage of one instrument over the other also catheters nephrostomies and special instrumentation like ureteric catheters, guide wires, newer devices. So, these are all important topics which can be asked. We have aqua ablation coming up for prostate. We have lasers which are commonly asked about the different type of lasers, the advantage of one laser over the other, their wavelengths, their characteristics and we have resin therapy. So, all these kind of newer devices which are coming, examiners are really fond of the newer devices because they keep hearing about them in conferences, uh, whenever they go to the exhibition halls and then it can always be in the mind of the examiner to ask about them. It also tells the examiner how abreast the candidate is with the latest that's going on in urology. So, uh, moving ahead, uh, in the basics only we have infection. So, a lot of questions come from the infection side. So, we should know about all the named infections, say starting from say about XGP and xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis to emphysematous pyelonephritis, malacoplakia and other named infections like forneas. So, all the infections which are particular to a certain organ interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, prostatitis, epididymitis. We should know about the basics and the common organisms which are causing these infections and the basics of management of these. And if there's any severity grading, then we should know the grading of the severity of the infection as well.
Then in immunology, because it's a vague topic, immunology is a part of Campbell's and that's why since it's a part, so some examiners may want to stick to some theoretical questions also. So in immunology, we can know about all the cascades, the process flows of various types of reactions in the body. But I would strongly advise you to stick only to the older questions because you know that way the immunology is very difficult to remember. It's not a very practical topic and uh, you know it's going to take a lot of revisions. It's not a very high yield topic. So just stick to old questions and I think you should mostly be able to answer anything that comes from the immunology. Just make sure that you have all the tables revised every time the complement cascade, the clotting cascade, the anaphylactic reactions cascade, the immunosuppression, immunotherapy cascade, how various immunosuppressing agents they act, what are the new things happening in the tissues line, the cell line. So all those kind of things you can just make tables and uh, flow charts and just focus on old questions. So just mark the old questions in your book or make notes of just the old questions and I am quite certain that they will be good to go. Now next is the reproductive urology section. Now here we can say this is the infertility section and then we have the andrology section or the sexual function section. In the reproductive section you should know about the HPG axis because a lot of medicines are going to act on this. So you should know basically how testosterone is being from right from the GnRH to uh, LHFSH and uh, the testosterone, how estrogen is converted from testosterone via the aromatase and what is the negative feedback, how do these serms they act, these selective estrogen receptor modulators, how can we boost testosterone by direct ways, indirect ways, what is HCG, HMG. So all these things you should know about the HPG axis. Then you should know very well how the spermatogenesis takes place. So the entire cycle of mitosis, meiosis, the various stages through which the sperm goes and what amount of time it takes and what is the root of the sperm ultimately once it comes out from the testes. So that should be crystal clear in our minds because numerical questions will be asked from this concept. We should know about the management algorithm because many times you know uh, there will be algorithms around azoospermia, there will be algorithm around aspermia, there will be algorithm around ejaculatory duct obstruction, around obstructive versus non-obstructive azoospermia. So basically we should uh, already know what's mentioned as a standard. What is the next step when we do when something happens because questions will come directly from a particular scenario or one arm of that management algorithm. And then if you have some other concept in mind and that not that exact algorithm, then there's a chance you may not be able to answer that question correctly. You should also know about the syndromes, about genetic defects, particularly Klinefelter's, Lawrence moon Bedel syndrome hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism uh, and here you may also want to club it up with DSD because some of them may not may be the same only. So uh, mosaic characters, Turner syndrome, the androgen receptor insensitivities like Reifenstein syndrome, mayer rokitensky kosterhauser syndrome. So all these basically around reproductive physiology are important because their incidences, their chromosomal aberrations, their features to differentiate between the two. The uh, pathophysiology of them, they may be asked from us in the reproductive part. Then we have the sac sexual aspect of andrology where you should know about the entire etiopathogenesis of erectile dysfunction. So how the uh, different chemicals they ultimately lead to releasing nitric oxide. We should know about the tests around the sexual function testing right from penile doppler to hormones. and the various dosages of the intracavernosal injections, medications. So all these values should be clear to us so that we can correctly answer in the exam. We should know about the prosthesis which are used for sexual dysfunction. We should know about all the drugs which are recommended for various things like premature ejaculation. So we know, we should know what is FDA approved. We should know the tables or the grade of recommendation. Priapism also is another very important clinical scenario. We should know how to differentiate the various types of priapism and then how to manage the priapism first with uh, aspiration and evacuation and then with medicines and then eventually with surgery. So the distal shunts, proximal shunts, they should well be clear in your mind. You should have a table around it.
Then a very important topic always is malignancy. So a lot of questions come from malignancy. So malignancies are high yield topics. We cannot say that, you know, you should read something in particular about malignancies, but I'll still try to define important topics from which we have seen questions coming in the last few years. So type of tumors, they are very important. Their markers are very important when it comes to testicular tumors. And then basically you should know what are the staging criteria and how you manage stage wise. So basically we know that HIO, high angon orchidism is the basic and we have to go for some sort of a radiotherapy or chemotherapy or observation. And what is the role of salvage surgeries? What is the role of PET CT? And how do you basically manage this patient if there's a recurrence? So these concepts should be clear in your mind. You may sometimes want to read the NCCN guidelines if you're bored of Campbell, because you know, it's almost congruous with whatever Campbell says, and it will be just a good uh, diversion from the, the standard boring textbook. So you can make notes around these because they will be algorithm based notes. It's quite easy to then revise through them. Then talking about CA penis again, it's a malignancy, so it becomes a high yield topic. So you should know about all the pre-malignant lesions which of them are really pre-malignant, which are not. We should know about the lymphatic drainage from the penis. Specifically also in testicular tumor, we should know about the lymphatic drainage and the crossovers which happen. And then in CA penis, node management is very, very important. So we should know the entire algorithm for node, node management. We should know about the surgeries for node management. What are the boundaries of these dissections? When do you do these dissections? What are the indications? So this is quite clearly given in Campbell. And examiner expects you to remember it as clearly. Moving ahead to renal physiology. So renal physiology, I think the most important thing is to know entirely the nephron, its course, and basically to know how things go in and out of the nephron, which is the uh, area from which particular drugs are absorbed, from, which is the area from which the particular ions are absorbed. So the ion movements should be very, very clear. How much percentage of what is removed from where in the nephron? You should know about retroperitoneal fibrosis. You should know about obstructive physiology, also about ureteric injury, uh, the grades of injury, the management of ureteric injury. We should know about retrocable ureter. So the concept should be clear how it forms, where it forms, how do we treat it. We should know CKD grading. A lot of questions are asked from CKD grading also. We should know about transplant, its complications, and we should know about immunosuppression, as I already said in the immunology part. You should know about how the various immunosuppression agents, they act, what are the criteria by which we select the recipient, the donor. So all these kind of things should be very, very clear to all of us when it comes to renal physiology. Also going ahead, urolithiasis is very, very high yield topic because here again, a lot of questions come around the values. So we should know how to evaluate for the recurrence, the metabolic profiling. We should know about all the important ions, the calcium, oxalate, citrate, their values. They should all be quite clear. And basically, how do we say that this is the reason of stone formation? That should be clear. We should know what are the various types of stones that form, what are the chemical compositions. We should know which kind of stone in what location will require which sort of a surgery. What are these surgeries? What are the complications of these surgeries? We should know clearly about the mineral metabolism. Uh, because these are just the same topics coming again and again. In Campbell, they're divided into four different chapters, but r rather it's one single unit. So starting from the composition to going to removal, you should know uh, everything about that particular kind of salt, uh, its alternate names, how it crystal looks like, how uh, it basically forms, what are the metabolic problems due to which it forms. Eventually, when it is stuck somewhere, how you treat it, which is the best modality of treatment of a particular stone, which of them are radioresistant, which are radiolucent, which are sensitive to lithotripsy, which are sensitive to laser. Uh, so all those kind of questions come from the urolithiasis part. Then talking about stricture, urethral reconstructive. Here you should basically know about the type of structures that are there. We should know what kind of surgery we can offer in these structures. What are the indications of these surgeries? What are the contraindications of these surgeries? And basically, we should know about how to manage a stricture, eventual follow-up of the stricture, a complication if the stricture is not managed. So all these kind of things can come as questions on stricture urethra. But stricture urethra is not something which is very, very commonly asked. Mainly, you should know about RGUs, how to read them and how to manage them. Then again, a very hot topic is renal cell cancers. So 
As I said, all cancers in neurology are very, very important. They are hot topics. So in RCC, we should know about all the benign lesions of the kidney. Also in adrenal, also we should know about all the benign lesions of the adrenal. We should know about cysts. The entire table on the classification, the Bosnic staging is very, very important. So that should be by heart. We should know how do we classify the cyst into 1, 2, 3, 4 and the 2F. We should also know what are the chances of malignancies of each of these type of cysts. And that's mostly about the questions on cysts. Then VHL, von hippel indel syndrome is important because we know that there's a lot of hereditary component for RCC. All the subtypes of RCC, that table in Campbell is very, very important where we talk about all the types, their features, their markers. We should know about the TNM staging of all these tumors and similar goes for RCC as well. We should know how to follow up if we've done a partial nephrectomy, if we've done a total nephrectomy. We should know about the imaging characteristics of the tumors of renal origin and we should know about the surgical details also, how the surgery is performed, what are the common incisions which are given, when do we prefer a particular incision, specifically the IVC thrombus part we should know, how to clamp, in what order to clamp, when to use uh, any uh, CTVS backup and you know how to deal the various maneuvers for different level of thrombus, we should know about the staging and classification of the level of thrombus. So all these kind of things are important for RTC and also for upper tract urinary cancers. Specifically, we should know about the minimally invasive treatments as they are getting more and more in vogue and where we can use, what are the indications of these, where we cannot use them, what are the contraindications of these. So this should all be clear about the renal tumors. In adrenal, we should know the metabolic evaluation because mostly the question will be around incidentalomas or around functional adrenal lesions. So we should know basically how to evaluate for the various types, uh, G, F, R, all the three layers of the adrenal, uh, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, androgens, though all these uh, we should know how to screen for. And particular interest will be on pheochromocytomas because they are commonly seen and countered in practical life also. So examiners are fond of asking about pheochromocytoma, everything from the imaging characteristics to the evaluation and the surgical management and how to prepare for the surgery basically that's another hot topic of questions. Then coming to a difficult topic which is bladder physiology and function. So I would particularly ask you not to give too much time to this topic because there are a lot of uh, theoretical things in this and because it's a functional thing sometimes it doesn't follow a lot of logic so you have to cram a lot of things. So what I would I like you to give focus on is drugs. What, what are the drugs which are used on the bladder? What are the effects on the bladder? And other molecules, uh, for example, you can have ANP, you can have nitric oxide, you can have endothelin. So how these specific molecules, they act on the bladder, relax the muscles, and that's something that you should make a chart of and cram it. Then urodynamics you should know about because a lot of times urodynamics is presented as a graph on the, in the question paper. You should know when you have to indicate the urodynamics, what are the things you see in the urodynamics. You need to know about the neurological lesions, the effect on the bladder function, for example, the various levels from the brain to the pons to the uh, S upper, upper to the upper spine, the lower spine, the pelvic part, and then we should know about automatic bladder, we should know about areflexia, we should know about autonomic hyperreflexia, we should know about overactive bladder medications because they are again a chart and we should know what is FDA approved, what are the side effects of each of them. We should know well about Botox because Botox is something which is uh, again, a very hot topic and being used more and more in urology. We should know the basics of incontinence surgery starting from the autologous to artificial or synthetic to the, sus sus to the suspension surgeries. And lastly, we should know about bladder trauma and the fistulas. So all the fistulas, we should know basically how to manage them. We should know how to identify these fistulas from one another. For trauma, we should know the grading, the basics of management of trauma. So questions are coming from around these things in bladder function and physiology. Then coming on to bladder cancer, again since it's a cancer, so it's again a hot topic. So we should know about the risk factors, we should know about the TNM staging, we should know how to screen for the bladder cancer because there are a lot of new tests which are coming. We should know about the BTA, BTA stat, we should know about Eurovision, 
so these things which are not very very successful but still they are becoming theoretically important we should know about how we do imaging in bladder cancer how we surgically manage what are the limits of resection very very important is the divergent type so we should know about the intestinal segments that we use we should know about CCP, continent catheterizable pouch, we should know about orthotopic, what are the indications, where we can do them, where we cannot do them, what are the metabolic complications which come and we should know the names of these pouches and diversions and also the anastomosis type, which of them is refluxing, which is non-refluxing and what are the advantages, what are the complications of each of them, which is highest in what so all these kind of things we should know make a chart and again keep revising it more and more prostate cancer i don't want to say too much because each and everything on prostate cancer is important simply because a lot of money is being given into research of prostate cancer because it's become a very very common cancer it's second most common even in india in the national capital region so all the markers the new medicines which are coming for prostate cancer the metastatic prostate cancer the hormone resistant prostate cancer they are all important questions and again i would definitely recommend you to go through nccn guidelines also and if possible then through the aua guidelines and the eau guidelines because here you know these guidelines would be a little ahead of time and uh, examiners may learn about things new things from the conferences which are presented in these guidelines and they may ask us uh, looking for candidates who are abreast with whatever latest is going on in urology and lastly we have a section on pediatric urology so pediatric urology we should know about all the developmental milestones what develops when when do the gonads start to differentiate when do the spermatogonia start to form when does the testosterone surge happen when does the kidney start to form when does the bud form when does the blastema form when does the division take place when does the chawala's membrane go away uh, so all each and every date you should have a list of things chronologically so that you have an idea that this is happening something before that so that kind of a thing you can make and then developmental anomalies you should know about what are the female to male ratios what are the lateralities what are the causes of these defects what are the associations of these defects with one another we should know about the incidence of each of these defects because these can all be asked as questions then you should know about ARPKD, ADPKD, all the renal cystic lesions, a lot of questions come. So we should know just the facts about these, not the entire detail about them. Uretric defects, again, we should know the incidences, yo-yo, uh, the which moiety, uh, lower moiety goes to form what kind of defects, upper moiety is associated with what kind of defects. So disorders of sexual differentiation, they are a difficult topic. But you should know the basic of these, uh, like the syndrome specifically. and uh, we should know about the basic principle of how to manage a DSD. We should know about VUR, the grading of VUR, the management of VUR. We should know about posterior uterine walls, bladder uh, in the posterior uterine wall, which is called the wall bladder syndrome. That's very important. Undescended testers, the management principles, the timings, again, the hormones, how they interplay to lead to UDT, they are all important. And lastly, we have pediatric tumors, which is again a malignancy. A lot of questions are being asked from nephroblastoma and Wilms and also from testicular tumor in children. So this is about the hot topics. This is how you should be giving focus to certain things over the others because they are more likely to be asked. Again, I would say that it's an exhaustive subject. So uh, try and you know mark things in your book so that you can quickly revise. The last minute confidence that you get when you've covered all the pages of Campbell, just a psychological impact is very, very important when you go to the exam why urology so uh, we know that you know there are passions for everybody somebody wants to operate upon the heart somebody wants to operate upon the mind somebody wants to operate on the skin make somebody uh, better looking in urology finding a passion is not very very easy because we are dealing with prostate we're dealing with men's health andrology all the private things that people don't want to talk about only thing you would say glamorous might be renal transplant for some people but apart from that why still people love urology and why they want to be urologists is because urology has everything to offer in terms of the surgical skills and most importantly it has technology at its core.
So if you are a tech freak, if you are somebody who likes to deal with technology, who wants to stay updated about technology, especially in the medical science, then urology is a branch for you. So urology as such is preferred mainly because it has less emergencies. So the, if you talk about the emergencies in urology, you will not find many emergencies. If classifying the emergencies in andrology, probably you'll have something like priapism, you may have a torsion and if you talk about urologic core then you may have retention and you may have trauma. So these are the common emergencies that you may see in urology but as you would see they are not something which is rampant. So it's a cool branch you get a lot of time to pursue other things your passions your hobbies but importantly you basically experience each and everything that surgery has to offer. So you would be experiencing the microsurgery, which will be in andrological surgeries and in varicocele repairs. You will be able to experience robotic surgery. So all the pelvic surgeries, they are now being done robotically. So this is something that you will experience easily in urology because you will have the prostate to work upon. You will have partial nephrectomies to take care of. So these are all a part of this. You will be able to enjoy laparoscopy. You will be able to enjoy plastic because you will be doing hypospadias repairs. You will be doing a lot of genital reconstruction. You will have experience with prosthetic urology, prosthetic surgery in the form of implants, sphincters, with neurology also if you if you like neuro neurology and if you like the nerves as such so you can probably do away with functional neurology open surgery is also there so basically every form of surgery which may be missing in other fields you know you may have each and every aspect of surgery well covered in neurology that's one of the other reasons why you know people really like neurology a uh, lot of problems in urology like prostate issues, like stones, they are very, very common. So a uh, lot of people uh, find that the clientele also is in enormity, which means that you will never basically have a saturation. You will always have patients who would need some urological care. So from that perspective also, urology is a very sought after branch. Talking about medical science. So urology is one aspect where we have a, still a lot of role for medicines. So you have both passion for surgery and me medical science and urology can offer both because you can still do very well if you are just not operating and just giving medicines to treat many of the conditions. So that's also again a very big boon with urology because you still get to practice medicine and you know this is something which is not there in many other branches where their things are essentially surgical. So with all that said, I think the topmost reason why you want to do a urology and should be motivated to urology is because the urologists are one of the most satisfied surgeons. They are one of the coolest people and they really live a good balanced life when it comes to following all the things that they dream of. Now moving ahead to how to practice in such a way that you can get to your dream branch which is urology is by making a right strategy to go ahead and be able to revise all the facts quickly in less number of days because the more you revise the more you'll remember them and more focus your approaches the better will be your chances of getting into urology i would like to wish you the best of luck for your preparation and if there are any more questions let's take them forward